<laughs> anyway, welcome to Manch. This is our like last minute squeeze in interview, which is kind of exciting. I'm glad that it's happening this way because I was hoping they would get momentum, you know, on the Manch sort of movement. And so I'm actually thrilled that we can squeeze this into the last minute. So please introduce yourself. Me too. Yeah, I'm Benjamin Crudwig um, from Benjamin Crudwig Fiber Arts and Design. So it's it's been self-branded ever since I started. Um, I don't have any clever names that deal with yarn. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I'm a knitter, crocheter, a spinner, a weaver, and a sewer. Pretty much anything that deals with fiber or textiles or fabric is something that I'm going to get my hands on. So tell us your story. How did you come to all of this? Um, so I learned in high school when um, it was Halloween and I wanted to be Mark from Rent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he has that striped scarf that is, you know, iconic to his character. And my sister ended up making the scarf, but she said, you know, you could learn and make this yourself at some point. And I was like, awesome, teach me. And I did it throughout high school for a little while, put it away. And then in college, I picked up crochet as a stress reliever and didn't pick up knitting until about four and a half years ago um, when I was working with some friends who also knit and it like reignited that excitement for it. Um, and I always had the problem with knitting that there weren't enough like menswear patterns. So I just started making my own stuff. You know, I was like, if they're not gonna write the patterns, I'm just gonna ride them myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and really ever since four and a half years ago, I just, I haven't stopped and just have fallen down the rabbit hole pretty hard. <laughs> when you talk about turning to crochet for stress, stress relief, how did you know that would relieve your stress? So it was kind of incidental. I had a friend who was making amigurumi dolls, you know, of like the, the Ninja Turtles. And I was first introduced, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> um, and so that's where I started and I enjoyed it and it was fun. And, but I realized that it was almost like meditation. Mm. So before a calculus exam, I was like, you know, why don't I just bring my crochet and I'll crochet for a little bit. And it calmed me down so much from where before I used to get really bad test anxiety. I didn't have it after I had crocheted. So it, it paired together ever since. Um, so anytime that I have something stressful that's coming up, I, I turn to fiber. <laughs> Did anyone notice that you were doing that before the test and have anything to say about it? You know, it, that's interesting because <laughs> in both high school and college, like nobody really mentioned it um, most of the time. Um, in college, I was in choir and I used to knit or crochet before choir. People would comment on it and say, oh, my grandmother used to do that or my mom knows how to do that. But nobody my age knew how to do it. And um, they, they weren't really like judgmental, but they were kind of like, that's a little weird, you know, that here's this guy just hanging out <laughs> outside the classroom, you know, crocheting stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry that they thought you were weird. Mm. <laughs> I've been weird my whole life, so it's, <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> I'm trying to raise my girls to be like, we're weird and that's okay. Like, yeah. what's most important is that you like yourself, weirdness and all. Exactly. Yeah. So you're a singer too? Um, so I used to be. I, I'm a choir a choir kid. My wife is the singer. She she does opera and she can keep that realm of the creative arts and I'll keep the fiber parts. <laughs> I I have terrible stage fright and I think working in a group is easy. Solo, mm mm. Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed my college choir. I liked I liked all the different pieces that I can't remember any of them right now. I can remember one actually that I really liked, but it, it is, there is something different about choral singing compared yeah. to the solo. That's for sure. Um, and so your wife, does she, does she perform in opera right now? Yeah, she's currently covering a role, um, at an opera local to us in Boulder opera. <laughs> um, but she's currently in like the, the process of going to summer programs and auditioning every fall for, for programs. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's it, we're in the early stages with her career, but yeah, opera is like opposite of dance, right? 
Like, the dancers burn out when they're, like, 20. Well, I don't know because I'm not a dancer, but, like, in their 20s, some of them. Yeah. But the opera singers, it just, they have this momentum that just carries them throughout their whole life. It's pretty cool. Well, and they have to grow into their voices a lot of the right. time their voices are huge. You know, so it's like sometimes you're ready, but your voice is like, eh, I need another year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Do you, a a Do you ever knit for her? I do. Um, she she doesn't wear as much as I would like her to, but you know it's <laughs> I'm I'm the knitwear guy, so it's yeah. she she'll steal my sweaters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that I knit for myself, mm-hmm. which you know I'm I, all for. I don't know how much of uh, stuff you've seen on my channel, but I inter- uh, I interviewed a girl named Sydney. She goes by Squidney Knits on uh, Instagram and elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And she has this whole knitmas, like, it's kind of like an algorithm, like an unscientific algorithm where she'll knit for people, but if she doesn't see them wearing it quite enough, like, they get X from the list, like, not knitting for you anymore. <laughs> so I think we all secretly wish people would wear our stuff, like, every day, you know? Yeah. Like a cartoon character that always has the same outfit on every day, like, when I knit for you, I want to see that every day. Uh, yes. <laughs> so tell me about going from college to like tell me all about your business and and how do people find you and what will they find and just talk about that yeah so <laughs> I started my business namesake in college um, I started selling my crochet dolls and hats and at that time you know it kind of helped with buying school books and as I graduated I was going to go into teaching um, and at that time it was kind of in the peak of the economic downturn, or I guess the valley of the economic downturn mm-hmm. and teaching jobs weren't going to new teachers. It was going to teachers who have been recently laid off. So I needed to figure out a plan quick. So I ended up getting a job at Shack Spindle Company, which is a company out of Boulder that builds spinning wheels and weaving looms. And it was completely random. You know, I needed a job. They had a job opening on Craigslist, and I took it. So since then, um, I started spinning, and I started weaving, and getting further into fiber arts. I've gone to TNNA and started writing articles, and it kind of started snowballing. So since then, I focused solely on the fiber arts and working in the fiber arts. So... You know, I have my design business still. It's taken a little bit of a hiatus as I've been preparing to teach. And um, also, I've been working more on fashion design. So, you know, it's like there's only so many hours in a given day. So it's like I'm, I'm focusing on the fashion design right now because it's more interesting to me at the moment. You know, tomorrow it might be weaving again or knitting again. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's been a surprise. Because what did you study in college? I studied ecological and evolutionary biology and a second major in studio arts with photography as my focus. Have you met anyone else with such a diverse double major? Not, it's not often that I meet people who have such a diverse double major, but I have found a lot of scientists in the natural sciences, so, um, you know, living, breathing sciences rather than chemistry or physics um they're very creative people (laughs) Mm -hmm. and i just frequently i don't think that they're taught to really explore that i see so so maybe like the way they were raised or you know depending on the town they were raised in it might have just sort of not opened them up as much as other places yeah, well, in, in, in the sciences, or at least at, at my school, you're taking so many credits of your major mm-hmm. that if you, aren't, if you aren't going out and taking outside classes, you're not getting the arts education at all. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you are taking, what, like 16 to 19 credit hours of biology. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's just not encouraged, I think, in some schools. So are you completely self-taught then with the crocheting and the knitting and the designing? Yeah, yeah. I I don't have any family members except for my sister who even remotely knew how to do any of this stuff. And I think it's just the way that I learn as a person is I pick something up. I watch some YouTube. um, 
I taught myself crochet out of a book and I was like, I'm going to learn this. Let's, let's dive in. I had a little bit more instruction with weaving uh, because I was in the company that built looms. So why not take up on that knowledge that people have there? <laughs> um, spinning, I'm also a little bit taught from people that I worked with, but for the most part, you know, I asked, can I take the showroom spinning wheel home, bought some fiber and sat down and played for, well, played frustratingly <laughs> for the first, you know, <laughs> the lumpy bumpy yarn that... My family always knows when I have the sewing machine out because they hear me like, I'm going to kill myself. They're like, whoa, yeah. <laughs> mom. Because <laughs> I'm always just like, that's my, that doesn't come as naturally to me as other fiber arts. Yeah, I just recently got a serger. And while I'm used to doing a regular sewing machine and like the tension is still like hard for me, serger, I was starting to say words that are not family friendly. Right, right. Like, oh, my neighbors must think I'm crazy. <laughs> yeah, and then they find out it's a sewing machine and not, like, some weird, crazy fight you had with your wife. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. So what is it like doing all of this as a man in the fiber arts? Like, like family support, friend support, your wife? Like, just talk about that because that's one of my sort of goals with Manch is to talk about your gender and your craft. Yeah, my wife is extremely supportive. Um, ever since I started, she's been my model. Like, my my fiber career has kind of followed along our, you know, our relationship. So she's been there since the beginning of when my career started to really build. Um, my family is supportive. I don't think they really understand what I do. Um, you know, they all have very traditional jobs and backgrounds, and I do not. But I don't think that was ever going to happen. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I think where I see the biggest difference is when I knit in public or I weave in public or crochet in public, I get a lot more comments of like, oh, like you're, you're knitting or you're crocheting. And people are taken aback that a man is sitting at like a coffee shop knitting. Mm-hmm. Um, I've never been made fun of or judged, which I think is uh, maybe a common misconception for a lot of men. Like they don't want to be considered like feminine or they don't want to be made fun of. Like I have never been made fun of. Um, I have been called grandma a couple of times in like a joking way. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was ever meant as like an insult. And I love my grandma. So it's like, great. (laughs) Um, I will say it's sometimes kind of isolating you know, being a man in a pretty, pretty female dominated industry. Oh, talk about that. Uh, So it's like, you don't always get that same camaraderie, you know, with another guy who knits or crochets. You're like, oh my gosh, you're another dude. You know, this is kind of unique still. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But I've never met somebody in the industry that I don't like, you know, everybody here has been very, very wonderful and supportive and willing to talk. So you know, it's, it is different being a guy because it's unusual, mm-hmm. but it's also, I don't feel well <clears throat> here. People say, a lot of the men have told me that it's kind of an icebreaker. Like people approach them more when they have knitting in their hands than if they're just, I guess, sitting there. Yeah, I can, I can definitely say that anytime that I'm out in public and knitting, there will be a conversation that strikes up from somebody random. And what excites me is that it opens up a conversation about handcrafts and, you know, whether or not somebody says that it's the right thing. So like if I'm knitting and they say, oh, you're crocheting or vice versa, it's a moment of education. Yeah, I do that. And it's also a little bit of a connection. Like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a knitwear designer and I'm working on a new pattern right now coffee shop works better today than the studio Mm -hmm. (laughs) and it does really open up a whole world of people that either don't know what it is and they want to know what you're doing people who used to do it and have that kind of reminiscent attraction like oh my gosh I used to do that or people who are also maybe closet knitters where Mm. they don't do it in public but 
they probably have a project in their bag right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's exciting. It's fun. I love it when I see people on the subway. The other day I was knitting my socks and a woman sat next to me like with knitting in her hand. Like she came on the train with it and I was like, hello, knitter. And she didn't really <laughs> feel like talking, but that's okay. I mean, I mean, I wouldn't have said hi to her otherwise, which was yeah. sort of fun. Let's talk about your patterns because I'm looking at your sweater right now, which I'm assuming you designed and knit. I did. I and did, I, and I, I've never published the pattern, um, which is crazy. But I, this is the first pattern that I made knit. Like, it's a shawl increase sweater. So I, I don't know if you can see, like, how the yeah. triangles, it's it's kind of like the back of a shawl. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm really liking the collar that it crosses over in the front. Yeah, this is my favorite type of collar. Pretty cool. And it's kind of in between, like, a cowl and a mandarin style <laughs> collar which I just like the look of it's mm -hmm. it's cool <laughs> yeah it is cool and you don't yeah. you don't notice it right at first at least I didn't maybe because I was looking at your blue glasses but I'm like oh look at that it's like a crossover <laughs> it's so cool yeah um I would love to publish this at some point I think it's it's time for grading the pattern which is my least favorite part of knitwear <laughs> what's grading is that when you make it for all the sizes yeah why is yeah. that hard? What tell us? Because some people don't know what that means. What is that? Yeah. So like with hats, you know, you pretty much it's one size fits all. You know, if unless it's you know a really small head for a child, um, large head for a man. For the most part, if you have the right amount of ease and stretch in it, it's gonna fit. Mm -hmm. With sweaters, everybody is a different size and a different shape and a different type of shape. So what fits me, you know, tall and slender does not fit the next guy who might be a little bit more burly, but shorter and figuring out what sizes do I offer? So, you know, you have the traditional sizes of small, medium, large, extra large, 2X, 3X. Well, you have to think about ease. So I think a medium is 38 inches chest plus whatever E, so two inches, four inches, five inches, depending on the fit. And figuring out what's gonna look good in all of the sizes with that much ease is the difficult part. And then you do, the width is different than how much you add for the height, for the sleeves, for the sleeve circumference, for the neck circumference. <laughs> so it's a lot of math. I was gonna say, that, you're not a fan of math. Which is funny, cause like I'm good at it. And if you put me down in front of a pad of paper and my schematic, I'll do it, but I'm more interested in the designing part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I want to get needles to yarn and make a finished object that looks good. Um, I did sweaters for the Twist Collective last year, um, and I don't remember how many sizes I had to knit, or... Grade. Grade, thank you. And I had knit the sweater for the man, and they wanted one for a woman too. And so we ended up adding a three quarter sleeve and like shorter hemline. And so I think there's overall like 10 to 15 different patterns, <laughs> you know, based on the grading sizes. And it's just, it's a lot of finicky details. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's complicated, but it's fun. Yeah. But I'd rather be designing. <laughs> right. So where can someone find your patterns to knit? Yeah, so most of them are on Ravelry. Mm -hmm. um, that's where I, I pretty much self-publish knitting patterns. I'm going to pull um, this up right now because I want to I talk about some. Keep talking. Yeah, so it's Ravelry. Again, Benjamin Crudwick is is how you find me. Um, I've made it easy on people. Good. <laughs> and BenjaminCrudwick.com has my whole portfolio of knitting, crochet, spinning, and weaving stuff. Well, okay. maybe not spinning, but a lot of weaving patterns. So... Um, Ravelry doesn't support weaving patterns. Right. So I, I have those hosted on my website or on the Shack Spindle website. Um, but most of my stuff is self-published. I do have a few things that are through like Twist Collective or Knitty. Um, spin to Knit was, or Spin and Knit last year was a publication where it's hand spun yarns with knitted patterns. And I oh, did two okay. patterns for that magazine, which was um, a lot of fun, a lot of fun. I'm looking at, so I see your wife modeling here. I'm assuming yeah. it's her. She's silly. Yeah, she's great. <laughs> and is that, who's who's the Nick Terrace shawl with the blue shawl? Who's that? 
That was for a yarn box, and so I have no idea who that woman is. Oh, this is... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I sent my sample off to them, and I, I have yet to re-photograph it in my style. Yeah. But they found somebody to photograph it on. And, That's funny. Yeah. I'm looking at these. I love the tectonic convertible cowl. That looks really cool. That one is my absolute favorite pattern and that's I've crochet. ever made. Yeah. That's really cool. I like how it has different sized stripes. Mm -hmm. and yeah. And go ahead. You, you'll start to see like I have a color scheme that I really like. Yeah, you're wearing it. So it's like it's green and gray. It's it's grello and it's <laughs> all sort of weird, kind of bright and then dark. Yeah. Stuff. And I'm loving this tectonic hat situation. Talk about that. Yeah, so that came from a tectonic cowl. I, I thought, you know, I, I need a hat to match my cowl. I did the crochet version. And then I was like, I bet I can knit this. And yeah, it I took a little while at like, figuring out how to pick up the stitches on the bias. Mm -hmm. And, you know, crochet is square. So the number of stitches that you have in length equals the width pretty much all the time if you're doing single crochet. Mm -hmm. In knitting, it's not always the case. Right. So I was glad that it worked out when it blocked out, you know, the hat. Um, but I was a little worried at first because, you know, you had these like short squat triangles that, I don't know, it didn't look very pretty in the beginning stage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what I've is... been working on a, a knit cowl pattern, but I haven't decided, I keep going back on whether or not it's going to be double knit or if I'm just going to do it with a lot of ends to weave in. So. Right. Um, I'm loving this Neptune's Tide also. That's really, I like those colors together also. Yeah, that one is probably it's... my favorite shawl that I've knit. So that one is out of Anzula Luxury Fibers Vera. It's their linen yarn. And it just the the yarn plus the stitch structure. Yeah made me fall in love immediately like it was done and I just I sat back and was like oh like <laughs> yeah I can't believe I made this yeah it's cool and I like the different ways you can wear it mm -hmm. so can you one of the things I like asking designers is what is your inspiration and what's your process so do you want to just yeah. choose one of these uh one of your patterns to talk about I mean I don't want to choose for you sure so um actually let's go with Neptune. Let's go with the Neptune, Neptune's tie. Okay, great. You know, since that one's fresh. I'll put a picture of it up here if you don't mind. I'll take it from your Ravelry yeah. page. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, um, let's talk about that. So <laughs> oftentimes, like, especially as a designer now who is working within the industry, I ask yarn companies if they would like to provide yarn support. And I say, you know, here's what I'm thinking. And I'll send them a rough sketch or I'll just say, I like these colors. Mm -hmm. So frequently I'll start with the yarn and the color scheme. I am very, very focused on how colors interact with each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, that's where I start. And then I'll sit with the yarn for a while. Sometimes it's like days, sometimes it's years. And I'll have to wait until like something comes to mind of this is what I want to make. Mm -hmm. Most often I find inspiration in nature. So I know you were talking to Nathan Taylor uh -huh. uh, from Flockmetician a couple of days ago, and he finds a lot of inspiration in the city. You mm -hmm. know, he lives in the city. I do not live in a city. You know, I live near one, but I've mostly spent my time out in nature and near nature. So that's where I draw a lot of my inspiration. So there's the idea of, you know, balance in nature, but it's not always symmetrical mm -hmm. so you'll see that in a lot of my work and that's Neptune's Tide you know all the different stripes are different sizes mm. but they're using um, I think I calculated here's where the math came in again each band of color is the same area same surface area oh okay but they're different shapes um, and the Lace portions are supposed to be kind of like water or mm -hmm. the net shape, which comes, you know, the Roman god of Neptune, the god of the sea. And then the solid portions are like the frothy waves or the, the rough seas. And that's where it comes from. Mm -hmm. um, and most of my patterns have some sort of basis in nature, whether it's color scheme 
or it's the um, actual motifs. My cat is on all of my knitting right now. <laughs> so I can show you one of the patterns that I haven't published yet, but it's snake cables. Like they're literal snakes in a traditional cable mm-hmm. and completely based off of nature. Mm-hmm. Um, the Art Nouveau period is my favorite. And I think that I base a lot of my design off of that art period where they were looking to nature as inspiration. Mm-hmm. I am quite a city girl myself, but I also have a home in the country, and I I totally understand, I think, where you get this inspiration, because I find myself saying to the girl, my I have three girls, I find myself saying to them all the time, everything comes from nature, like, look at that, what does that remind you of, you know, it, it, because, you know, the design of, like, a toilet, or, you know, mm-hmm. just some utilitarian thing that we have came from, you know, probably... And, you know, a walnut shell, you know, or whatever, yes. right? So I, I just, I like pointing that out when something that I see in nature reminds me of something man-made. I'm like, this came from nature. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, and we we are so connected as fiber artists to nature without even knowing it. Like, I suppose when you're using acrylic yarns, you know, it's that's a man-made material. But yarn was invented from fiber you know from animal fiber or plant fiber Mm -hmm. and that was a connection to the earth that we had as people Mm -hmm. and especially i think this trend nowadays of using organic yarns or wools or you know if you're using cotton or linen or bamboo you know it's this idea of coming back to the earth with what you're making Mm -hmm. that's a direct connection that we have to the earth whether or not you spun the yarn from a sheep that you know, <laughs> right. or you bought the yarn, you know, at a yarn store down the street. You know, there's still a direct connection there. I really want to educate people on that because it didn't. My eyes were really not open to that until I started listening to Woolful the podcast. Mm-hmm. Because I started on acrylic, I still use acrylic. I have a bag yeah. of acrylic right here for my Easter bonnets. I mean. Yeah, I'm wearing acrylic. It's a wool acrylic blend. It's like peak. This is going on my head in a couple ah! weeks. Oh, that is so cute. Um, but, but, you know, it's, in, unless you just stop and think about it, and that's for everything, right? Where does my food come from? Like, after I had a yeah. garden this summer, I was like, how do I not have bugs in my food every single meal? How <laughs> do I not have bugs in my food? You know? Because right. there's, I've spent so much time with bugs this summer, you know? Yeah. So, I, and I was teaching my daughter's pre-K class. I was like, do you have pants on? Raise your hand if you have on pants. If you have them on pants, that came from plants. And, you know, because you just, we're not, we skip over that now in our education because yeah. we don't think it matters, but it does. It totally matters. <laughs> I was just watching a video yesterday on how silk is made and my mind was just blown. I mean, I was just Isn't watching. Isn't that amazing? I mean, I, I, I just was like, are you kidding me? Of course my silk dress is that expensive. Like, yeah. So. It's well, like the high quality silk that. You know, they're they're taking straight from the cocoon, you know, where I don't even know where to begin. Like, they pick up the individual thread from each cocoon to bring it together I know. and then reel it. I know. And it's like, I have trouble threading a needle. I know. You know, and they're, like, picking up these tiny little things that are, mi- not microscopic, but nearly no, they microscopic. they are so thin. Yeah. And sitting there, and, like, I saw a video of a woman just sitting on the floor doing it. And she was, like, rubbing it on her leg to, like, get... And I'm like, someone does this day in and day out uh-huh. so that I can have my Banana Republic wrap dress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, I don't know. I was a little ashamed. I'm like, I shouldn't tell anyone I own silk. <laughs> um, okay, so, and uh, do you still sell on Etsy? I don't. Okay. Um, so it's been a long time. Well, and I don't know. A lot of people may have had a similar experience, but it's very hard to make a living. Uh, when you make the goods yourself. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I found that patterns were a more economically viable way Mm -hmm. to create something and share it with the world without having to make it over and over and over again. Yeah, good. Uh, You know, as makers, I think it's very important for us to value our work. And at least when I started on Etsy, it was very, very early on when they were first created. You know, I think it was 20... 10 or 2009 mm-hmm. that I started. Um, and for a while there, it was fine. 
you know, I could sell my work for what I thought it was worth. But over time, people consistently undersell their own work. I know. And therefore, it brings down, you know, the market. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I got busier, so I didn't have the time to make the stuff. Mm-hmm. And so, again, it was much easier to create the pattern once or twice, depending on if I need to work some kinks out, get it tech edited, and then publish. Do you build community on Ravelry? Like, do you do knit-alongs, or do you have blog posts or videos or anything that someone could tap into? Yeah, so um, I do have a YouTube channel, um, and I do. I used to do a lot of tutorials there on crochet, so you can learn how to crochet online like I did um, over on my channel. And then I also have a about a monthly podcast called Design Time, mm-hmm. where I talk mm-hmm. about what I'm knitting, what I'm weaving, spinning, whatever, and I take more of a design bent, so I talk about my thought process of specific projects, why I chose certain colors, why I did things, um, as opposed to just saying, here's a pattern by this person that I'm knitting with this yarn. Mm-hmm. Um, I love those podcasts, and I, I watch them daily. You know, work, Again, working from home, it's like nice to, like, oh, let's, let's chat with this person today. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I... YouTube is a big place for me. My blog is not as active as it should be. Um, I do a lot of writing for other people, so it's like I don't do enough for myself. I don't know why that's a, you know, a barrier for me. Um, I don't do as many knit-alongs or crochet-alongs as I would like. I find it kind of hard to manage them, Mm -hmm. but I love supporting them. So it's like if people are doing them with my patterns, I am happy to repost, share, send it off, as long as I don't have to do the organization. Right, <laughs> right. Like, I do that for my clients. It's like I don't really want to do it for myself. Yeah. So your client, talk about your clients. Is it just, is it yarn companies? Is it publications? Like who are, who are your clients? Yeah, yeah so for my design business, um, <laughs> most often it is either yarn companies or it is publications. Um, so I am pretty connected to Spinoff Magazine and Handwoven Magazine. That's kind of where I got my writing start. Um, I think Spinoff was my first, my first published article, like in a big magazine. And that was really, really exciting. Mm -hmm. And since then I've done, um, gosh, publications, articles. Yeah, I know. It's early there. Yeah. It's like my brain just like was like words, whatever. You don't even have kids yet. I, you're in trouble. No. No, I'm just kidding. No kids. And my brain is already fried. <laughs> um, so recently they've done publications through those companies called Little Looms and Spin and Knit, um, which are subsets. So spin off, it's going into Spin and Knit, where it's hand spun yarn knit patterns. Mm. Little Looms, it's weaving patterns designed for small looms. So it's kind of starting to break into that knitting market. Um, for my day job, I do marketing and advertising, and most of my clients there are yarn companies um, and manufacturers, yarn mm. manufacturers. So it is, I'm very meshed yeah. <laughs> into the community. So whether I'm working with you as a designer or I'm your marketing manager, your agent, like I, I probably know you somehow. There's some degree of separation between us that's, one or two degrees. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever get to knit for pleasure? I, yes. Good. <laughs> um, since I've taken a little bit of a design hiatus from knitting and have been focusing on weaving and textiles, mm-hmm. I've started just knitting for pleasure again, which is so nice. Like not having to keep track of stitch counts yeah. or increases and decreases. I'm just going, yeah, I'm going to knit this until I'm done. I don't have a deadline. I don't have to get this to, like, I just finished two patterns for publication in the middle of March, and they were my last, last patterns for a while, and I was like, oh my gosh, so this is what it's like to knit without a deadline. Right. Right. It's like, I love deadlines, because they get me moving, but wow, (laughs) I can just sit and knit when I want to. Yeah. The yeah. only time I felt that was when I was making stockings for MTV, and there was a little bit of a, we, we had this creative process that 
was really great with the, the, the man and I who were working on it. But then every once in a while his boss would like nix an idea or add a person. Oh. And so I totally understood that and it was fine, but it made the process a little longer than I anticipated. And I found myself, I'm just like, I'm glad you're eating dinner. Like, I have to finish this stocking, you know, and, and that was yeah. the only time I felt it. And it was kind of exhilarating. And then also just like that relief when it was done. Yeah. So. Well, and I think last year, because I was knitting so many sweaters, I... The, the amount of work that goes into a sweater is already intense. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like whether you're using your, your bulky yarn or fingering weight yarn, it's a lot of work. And for men, you know, they're larger sweaters. You know, it's like you don't get this like petite size sweater that you can make one and be like, great, it's done. I can do the pattern. It's like you're dealing with a lot of fabric to knit. Mm -hmm. And then the grading of the patterns and it goes to tech editor Tech editor finds something that you missed, and then you have to look it over and go, wait, what was I thinking mm -hmm. here? Send it back, and it goes back and forth. And um, it's a different side of things that I don't think a lot of people understand. Mm -hmm. And you know, some people might kind of balk at the price of a really nice knitting magazine. And it's like, you have to think about the work that goes into each and every pattern mm -hmm. from the designer to the tech editor to the person who does the layout, the main editor, the photographer. Um, it's a lot of work and it is exhilarating to see it all come together. But there are times where somebody nixes something or says, actually, can you knit it this way instead of this way? And it's like, that wasn't my intent, but yeah, I'll, I'll see what I can do. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's a learning process each time, which is always good. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very different than knitting for pleasure. <laughs> there's a different feeling. You know, there's a little bit more of like a fire under your butt mm -hmm. to get something out and to the people who need it. <laughs> how do you find more people to design for? Is it like, how do you shop your portfolio? Like, how do you get more work? How does that work? Yeah, so it's actually kind of like who you know mm -hmm. at first. So... If you work with a yarn company already that you love their yarn and you have a stash of it, start there. Okay. And okay. you start by knitting a project, knitting a pattern, designing it, and then you reach out to them and you say, hey, I, I created this pattern. And that's where it starts. And that started with me with Anzula. Um, and they have been fantastic and have been kind of consistent person that I can design for and I say I need yarn support and they say great and I send them a pattern <laughs> um, it's usually always self-published but I usually send the sample to them so that they can take it with them on their trunk shows once you get a foothold with a yarn company then sometimes you can ask for a letter of recommendation to get into another yarn company um, and TNNA has been a big help. So that's the National Needle Arts Association for people who don't know. Mm -hmm. And it's a collection of yarn manufacturers, retailers, and um, equipment manufacturers in the industry, in the US, mostly in the US, there are some international companies. Going to those events and networking with people is perfect because oftentimes people don't want to take a chance on an unknown. But when they meet you in person and you can say, this is what I like doing, and they can get your personality, mm -hmm. they will hand you yarn, and then it's your responsibility then to create a pattern. Um, and it starts there. And then you just, publication after publication, send in calls for submission. You know, you'll get a lot of rejections at first, or maybe you'll get one on the first go. But it's important to keep yourself sharp and to keep yourself relevant, to just keep putting work out there. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's very, very important to just be unrelenting. Are you going to TNNA in Columbus coming yes. up? Yes. Yeah. I'm just so trying to decide if I'm going. You should go. There's going to be so many awesome people there. Columbus is my favorite show. Yeah. Um, that It seems to be the one where most people can make it because it's pretty central, central in the U.S. Like... When they do it in the winter in San Jose, it's like too West Coast for anybody past like Colorado. Yeah, and it was weird. It was
was weird timing too. It felt yeah. Well, it's far... the same with the CHA. Yeah. And it, you know, that's some people's busiest time in the shop. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like mm-hmm. winter; people are buying yarn. Yeah. Um, so they can't make it out. And then last year, the summer show was in Washington D.C. Yeah, I went to that one. And it was. I feel like I should have seen you then. Well, but... okay. Well, first of all, I had started my videos the day before I left for DC. Oh. So I didn't even know myself. Like I didn't even know who Christy <laughs> Glass was. Yeah. I I know that feeling. But the first I time just... I went to TNA, I was just like, I work for this company who makes looms and spinning wheels, but I don't know anything about the people, the people like yeah. who are these people that I'm gonna be talking to. Yeah. And then designers who I've been awestruck by over the last few years, I was like, oh, like, is that real life? Like, am I sitting across the aisle from this person? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I just went and I walked around because I didn't, I, I mean, I, the reason I wanted to go is because of all the Instagram photos of TNNA and I'm like, yeah. I want to go to there. Right. Yeah. And so I, I went and I met, I actually met Kathleen Dames there, which has been a really good friendship. And, yeah. um, so she was probably my best takeaway from the first TNNA and Amy from Knit Collage. I feel like Amy mm. and I really connected and I'd really like to go uh, visit her in Boston and do an interview with her. Um, but yeah, I feel, I'm wondering if more people will know who I am like the next time around. I don't know. Definitely now. Maybe. I mean, yeah. like when you look at your channel and how many people are engaged with you, yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's not a huge industry. Yeah, that's true. So, and and that's something that I forget and remember all the time, mm-hmm. is that it's not a huge industry. So, like, somebody's going to know somebody else that you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I thought maybe I'd go and just see, because I, I would love to get, um, I'd love to connect more, I'd love to collaborate more. Uh, I would love to, you know, have people say, talk about my yarn on your channel, that would be awesome. So. Yeah, that's the perfect place. Yeah. The perfect place to do it and it's so much more chill than like Vogue Knitting Live which is just like all the people well because it's a that's a retail show right and so you have all the people who are customers Mm -hmm. buying yarn and buying for the attention of the owners of these companies or the the vendors at TNNA it's not open to to consumers it's only open to industry professionals who either are part of TNNA or I think you can get a day pass um, if you're not a member, I don't know. I think sure. you have to be a member. I but... I don't remember if it's new or not that they have a new day pass oh, for non members. Um, I might be misspeaking. Yeah. I haven't read that email in a couple research. of days. <laughs> yeah, research. Um, but you know, like a membership for a non member is not that much per year, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the access that it grants you to professionals, you know, whether it's a mailing list or the actual show, yeah, um, it's worth it, you know? And you can actually spend time talking with the people yeah. who make the yarn. That's true. You know, it's great. And they have a fashion show. I don't remember like, that. Maybe I missed which, it. Yeah, it's, it's um, I think it's opening night of the show. That's probably why, Friday and night. And it's, it's right at the end of the night. Yeah, you, you know, you go grab a cocktail and you watch the fashion show of all the knitwear that's new that season. Yeah. Which is fun. It's fun to see what trends pop up, you know, out of out of the blue. Yeah, you're convincing me to go. <laughs> oh darn! <laughs> so before I do my nine questions, do you have yeah. any parting words for anyone who just wants to wants your life? Wants to do, do, it. What you're doing? do it. Do it. Um, do it. Do it. Find some yarn and find some needles or crochet hook and just get started. That's you know, it doesn't matter if it's chunky yarn and acrylic and big needles. Like, if you feel inspired, don't hesitate. Just do it. Do what makes you feel good and do what makes you feel happy. And then connect with other people. You know, don't be afraid to ask questions from other people. You know, it's like, that's why I reached out to you. I was like, hey, like, I love what you're doing. I would love to talk to you. You know, like, make those connections with people and don't be afraid. You know, like... I'll reiterate, I've never been made fun of in public for being a man and being a knitter. I've never been made fun of online. I've never been made fun of social media. 
I've only gotten support and this industry in particular is so supportive of people and of designers. And I think if you have that urge, just go for it. <laughs> nice. nice. Ready? I'm ready. Knit or crochet? Currently knit. Weave or spin? Weave. Cashmere or alpaca? Alpaca. Bulky or fingering? Bulky. <clears throat> sweater or socks? Sweater. Sweater, sweater, sweater. Color or neutral? Even though what I'm wearing is not indicative, I'm going to go with neutrals. <laughs> Favorite place to knit in public? Coffee shop. Favorite project of all time? Of all time is my tectonic cowl. My tectonic convertible cowl. That's my favorite of all time. Still wear it to this day. What's on your hook or needles right now? I think you said I'm it. I'm working already. on a fingering weight shawl that is taking forever, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Benjamin, it was so nice to meet you. Thank you so much for being on Manch. Yeah, thank you, and I will see you at TNMA in a couple of months. I got to plan it now. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.